we have come now to Jeremiah chapter chapter 14. So we continue with the story of Jeremiah, and in verse 1 it says, The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah concerning the droughts. Now the Hebrew word the droughts uh, literally implies drying out and cracking. Drying out and cracking. Brethren, that is also prophesied for the uh, land of physical Israel today, that at one point there will be horrible drought that is going to imply drying out of the land and cracking and there will be the dust uh, under your feet and there will be there will be a bronze the sky will be like bronze above your heads that's prophesied in Leviticus 26 and also in Deuteronomy 28 for those who do not obey God and we know that Israel after flesh does not obey God at all in fact they are just going ever contrary to all the ways of the eternal now I'm also reminded that until yesterday we had the first pouring grain in two months we have been suffering terrible droughts in Europe for about two months now, and uh, you can just imagine how the effects of that during the summertime. So, uh, for the first time yesterday, we had a, a pouring rain after a long time, and uh, I realized what a great blessing the rain is. I used to hate rain when I was unconverted, but uh, now that we are converted, we are to think differently and we are to think, you know, in terms of God's blessings. The rain is a great blessing, so we should always be rejoicing when rain comes. In uh, verse 2, it says, Judah mourns and her gates languish. They mourn for the land, and the cry of Jerusalem has gone up. Now, the word gates, of course, just mean trades. Uh, the merchandisers coming in and going out, you know. So the gates languish, meaning there is no business, brethren. Nobody is coming in and going out, you know. The drought is so horrible, so crippling that everything has has been halted, you know. Verse 3, their nobles have sent their lads for water. They went to the cisterns and found no water. They returned with their vessels empty. They were ashamed and confounded and covered their heads. So we have proud people here, you know, we have brethren here, rich people, political highbrows, you know. They are ashamed, but they will send little ones to look for water. There is no water, so they cover their heads as a sign of repentance. Now, interesting enough, later in chapter 17, we're going to find God likening himself to a cistern of clean water to the system of living water and then he says God says then in verse 7 in chapter 17 though those who apostatize from me their names are written on the earth interesting enough you do remember when the woman when the woman was caught in adultery and then she was brought before Jesus and they said well this woman committed adultery what is the punishment and interesting enough interestingly enough he was writing something on the ground we could just speculate what, perhaps their names or perhaps their secret sins that nobody knew about. So, in any case, you know, God likens himself to a cistern of a living water, of a clean water. And then he says, you know, but you, my people, you don't want uh, me, the source of living water, you want your broken sisters, your, you know, sisters that are not good. Interestingly enough, in chapter 17, you find that, again, the hope of Israel, which is actually the mikveh, Israel mikveh, being the, being the uh, ritual, ritual bathing, bathing basin that even the Jewish people to this day do use in various synagogues when they immerse themselves ritually to be ritually cleansed. So mikveh, Israel, the hope of Israel, the hope of Israel, of course, is brethren that one day they'll get God's spirit and they'll be able to be empowered by God's Holy Spirit and they'll be having a new spirit put in their minds and their hearts and then they will turn finally to the eternal. That's the hope of Israel. That's exactly why our library here is called the hope of Israel because Israel is a prototype of all the nations which means that the hope of Israel is at the same time the hope of all the nations around the world. And we know the mystery. The mystery is that uh, all people will be grafted into Israel so that they can be saved. What a wonderful plan that God has given us. So we have proud people, rich people. You know, they sent, they sent these lads looking for water. Verse 4, because the ground is parched, for there was no rain in the land. The plowmen were ashamed. They covered their heads. You see, 
Brethren, if God wants to chasten anyone, he has an easy way to do it. All that he has to do is just shut off the rain, and that will take care about just everything in time. We have experienced some of that right now in the last two months here in Europe. Uh, you know, the, 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 the levels of, of rivers had shrunk to the point that even those that rivers that you can use for ships and, and, and trade were unable to be used for ships and trade and, 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 and ship traffics because, you know, it was the, uh, the level was so low so that they couldn't. Not to mention other smaller rivers. Some of them even dried up. Verse 5. Yes, the deer also gave birth in the field, but left because there was no grass. You see, even animals, by their instinct, will not try to protect their little ones if there is nothing to eat and nothing to drink. Interesting, you know. The Bible here contains, as you see, scientific facts. The Bible gives us scientific facts as well. Some of them, and we can read them in, the, in God's Holy Word. Verse 6, And the wild donkeys stood in the desolate heights. They sniffed at the wind like jackals. Their eyes failed because there was no grass. As I said, brethren, God has a lot of science in the Bible. You know, wild donkeys, they can smell water. You can imagine how far away. So they stick their noses up in the wind and sniff the wind. But So the jackals do that, you know. But they cannot find water, you see. O Lord, verse 7, Though our iniquities testify against us, do it for your name's sake. For our backslidings are many, we have sinned against you. Now, the word iniquity here is not just missing the mark. We know that usually when we sin, we miss the mark. We miss the mark and then we strive to, you know, uh, hit the mark in our further life. But this is not just missing the mark. It's not just the sin of our nature, brethren, here. The, the, this word iniquity, it's not our, you know, uh, uh, it is our lawlessness and our rebellion. That is what it says in this verse. You see, when you keep sinning and keep neglecting how destructive it is for our lives, then that turns into rebellion. It turns into total lawlessness. That's what this word iniquity here means. Uh, that is how sin has got to be bad before God does all these things described here. You know, people keep sinning and become basically their nature, becomes their way of life. We've already read that in previous chapters, and we'll be reading that in more in chapters to come. In chapter 19, for example, we are going to read about how they desecrated the land, and how they desecrated the valley of Tophim, Toph in Hebrew meaning beating the drum. They were beating the drums as they were sacrificing their children so that they would just uh, not hear their cries. They were sacrificing their children in chapter 19 in that valley. Hinnom Valley. I've been on the edge of Hinnom Valley, by the way, and but we'll talk about that when we get to chapter 19. So, this is in verse 7, how sin has got to be bad before God does all these things described in this chapter. We have sinned. Oh, we have missed the mark. You know, we have backslidden. But the worst of all our iniquities, our rebellious testify against us. They are a witness against us. They are Obvious by the curses that have fallen upon us that our iniquities have been there. And here is verse 8. What a surprise what we read. Oh, the hope of Israel. <laughs> His savor in time of trouble. Now you get, and you, now you grasp, brethren, why we call our library hope of Israel. Our library is there to help us flame this hope. Hope of Israel, this flame that our Savior is there in time of trouble. Why should you be like a stranger in the land? The nay people ask God. And like a traveler who turns aside to tarry for a night. Yes, we want to have this zealous flame, this hope of Israel burning in us. So they say, brethren here, O oh God, for your own sake. These countries have been known as Christian countries. And after you have chastened us, for your name's sake, intervene. Why should you be a stranger in the land? 
you know, the land is given now to Orientals and to the Beast Bar, and you are just like a stranger who stays overnight and then goes away tomorrow. Now, just to remind you, brethren, the land is given to Orientals, yes, indeed, because the land, which is today Judea and Samaria, the land is going to be occupied by the beast power at one point. When the coming European dictator breaks the peace deal of Daniel 9.27 in the middle of that peace, because the peace deal or the covenant will be confirmed for seven years, as the prophecy says, he is going to break it in the middle. So after three and a half years after that peace deal, the Jerusalem will be occupied and the uh, abomination of the desolation will be set up in Jerusalem. And then later, one year, so after two and a half years, in the last year before Christ's return, this beast is going to mess up with Orientals, Chinese and Russians, and all the Asiatic bloc. And once he does it, then all of these Asiatic forces are going to rush straight into the land. And of course, they'll have some kind of peace, obviously, with the beast power there. And they will all together be joined and gathered at Armageddon to fight the returning Christ. Verse 9. Why should you be like a man astonished, like a mighty one who cannot save? Yet you, O Lord, are in our midst, and we are called by your name. Do not leave us. So that would be the attitude of the carnal man of the world before God intervenes to restore the house of Israel. Verse 10, thus says the Lord to the peace people. Thus they have loved to wander. They have not restrained their feet. But then they have not. They have not restrained their feet. They have tried, it seems, as we read in the Bible. They have tried, it seems, all kinds of, all forms of worship. Exactly what God told them not to do. He says, do not inquire how, how, how all these other people have worship their God and just, you know, just discard it, just, just ignore it, do not inquire into their cults. But, you know, Israel, Israel being Israel, rebellious, stubborn, and self-willed, Israel just, uh, it seems, has tested almost all forms of terrible pagan worship. Therefore, the Lord does not accept them. He will remember their iniquity now, that's the, here is that word again, iniquity, so their rebellion, their lawlessness, and punish their sins. Well, you know, you know, the thing is, brethren, look at your nations now, your so-called Christian nations. Are they taught to overcome? No. Are they taught to resist sin? No. Are they taught to tell themselves, no, you cannot do that. No, you should not do that. No, you cannot do that. Oh, no. Your Christian, so-called Christian nations, are taught that there are no eternal truths. Depending on circumstances, there is the best life for any time. The adultery can be good for your marriage. There is also a time to steal. Somebody has too much. You don't have very much, so it is obvious that you can take some of his possessions. You see, that is what people are being taught all the time, and that is why it says that they have loved to wonder. And the Lord does not accept them, brethren. He is not going to allow them to represent Christianity to this world. And that's why the so-called Christian nations are first to be punished. Well, I might say the leading Christian nations, those who are leaders in Christianity, like the Anglo-Saxon nations, who boast of their Christianity, well, they're going to be the first one to be punished because God is not going to allow them to represent Christianity to this world. It's a false Christianity. You know, there was often a theory that I've heard that uh, the greatest success Satan has done is that he uh, succeeded to convince people that he does not exist. Well, to be honest with you, brethren, I'm starting to think that actually the greatest success he has done is that he has created this false Christianity that looks 
almost like the genuine one, that looks almost like the true one, but it has nothing to do with Christ, has nothing to do with his apostles, has nothing to do with the primitive church. And how amazing. He has created this kind of, this form of Christianity into which all the so-called Christian nations have fallen. Verse 11, Then the Lord said to me, Do not pray for these people, for their good. You see, as I mentioned in the past, the time comes when, if people don't do what they can do for themselves, then other people cannot do anything for them. What other people can do is to pray for them. And the best example is when Christ prayed for Peter, that he would not fail, yet brethren Peter failed anyway. You see, Peter did not pray for himself. When they fast, verse 12, I will not hear their cry. And when they offer burnt offering and grain offering, I will not accept them. But I'll consume them by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence. Here again, those three, remember? Those three that are always a encapsulation of the punishment coming upon the house of Israel. Famine, sword, and pestilence. You see, what is your attitude when you're fasting? You see, when they fast, I'll not hear their cry, God says. You see, you're earnest about something, you know. You really show God how much you're really beseeching Him about something. And in this verse, we have those three things that will conquer the modern house of Israel. The sword, the famine, and the pestilence. Over and over, when we read those, those three represent the summary of the punishments to come upon the house of Israel. In the book of Ezekiel, you remember when we were analyzing that book, we found how it looks when that prophet cut his hair He was weighing it on the scales and then doing with it what God told him to do. Verse 13, Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, the prophets say to them, You shall not see the sword, nor shall you have famine. But I'll give you a short peace in this place. Well, so we all know, well, it is the fulfilling prophecy when prophets from Christian religions come out and say, why, we need to get rid of these sundown and bad-mouthing radio preachers, we need to get people to realize that we are going back to religion, and this great moral majority is going to have a great revival and go back to Sunday keeping more vigorously. And here comes the mark of the beast. So again and again, God tells us, that there are going to be a bunch of prophets, and those prophets, brethren, will be saying, Oh no, you are not going to see war. No, there will be no famine. So when you hear those prophets, when you hear them say that, just remember that even that is the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Even that is a guarantee that it is going to come and it is going to happen. Verse 14, And the Lord said to me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. What an audacity, brethren. They prophesy lies, but not lies in their own name, but lies in his name. They lie in his name. They they, they call upon him. They uh, quote him, cite him, and prophesy lies in his name. Well, we've got plenty of those in our nations, don't we? And God continues, I have not sent them. I have not commanded them, nor spoken to them. They prophesy to you a false vision, divination, a worthless thing, and the deceit of their hearts. Yes, brethren, they come out as a, as Christian preachers, don't they? They come out as Christian prophets. But God says, I have not sent them. I have not inspired them. They don't go by the scripture. What they preach is worthless. It is a false divination, a false vision. It is satanic. Notice again, brethren, false vision, divination, a worthless thing, and the deceit of their heart. Four again, you know. Over and over and over again we find these four. Number four. And I mentioned already in the past that that's usually God revealing himself or revealing something of his, of his own plan or something of his own prophecies anyway. So we have these four. (coughs) 
verse 15. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who prophesy in my name, whom I did not send, and who say, sword and famine shall not be in this land. By sword and famine, those prophets shall be consumed. Well, they wouldn't believe it, brethren. They wouldn't listen. Then, what is going to happen? Well, they are going to get it first because others might have listened if those false prophets hadn't been turning them off and away from it. So they are going to get it first. And the people, verse 16, to whom they prophesy shall be cast out in the streets of Jerusalem because of the famine and the sword. They'll have no one to bury them, them nor their wives, their sons nor their daughters, for I will pour their wickedness on them. You see, if we read what Romans did in 69 AD, when they surrounded Jerusalem and let people starve to death by just surrounding them, and what all went on within the city, cannibalism and everything else, but that's exactly what happened already, and the prophecy says will happen again. Now don't blame God for that. That's what people do. That's humans. That is war. That is man's thinking with a lot of Satan, Satan's influence. And they will not be buried. We see again the four. The wives, the sons, the daughters, the husbands. Therefore, verse 17, you shall say this word to them. Let my eyes flow with tears night and day. And let them not cease. For the virgin daughter of my people has been broken with a mighty stroke, with a very severe blow. Now we notice what God poured on them in verse 16. Alright. What he poured on verse, in, in verse 16. He poured on them their wickedness. So not just their sin, not just their trespasses, not just transgression, nor even just the human nature. He poured on them their wickedness. Verse 18, if I go out to the field, then behold those slain with a sword. And if I enter the city, then behold those sick with famine. Yes, both prophet and priest go about in a land they do not know. So here he is telling us exactly what we read in Ezekiel chapter 5, about the thirds and what is going to happen to them. If you go out, you find those slain with a sword. If you get to a place protected in a city, you find those dying from heaven, famine, and you end up sick with famine. Both prophet and priest go into a land they don't know. So they're going to go first into captivity because they disagree and badmouth and were counteracting what God's servants were saying, you see. Verse 19. Have you utterly rejected Judah? Has your soul loathed in Zion? Why have you stricken us so that there is no healing for us? We looked for peace, but there was no good. And for the time of healing, and there was trouble. So you see, it's going to be a while after they are rejected and captured before God decides to intervene. After those years of the Great Tribulation, there will be deliverance, there will be healing, there will be peace. Yes, indeed. And brethren, we have the integral part in all of that. Yeah, just imagine people being released from the death camps and neo-Nazi concentration camps. Brethren, that's what it is in the Bible. And I don't care if there are any of you who would say, oh, don't speak so harsh. We cannot take it. You have to take it because that's what the Bible says. The problem of the Laodiceans, keep in mind, is that they simply do not believe what is written in God's Word. And God's Word is what? What is God's Word? Well, it's Christ Jesus talking to us. He is the Logos, the Word. The problem of the Laodiceans is they do not really believe that the Great Tribulation will be that horrible. That the coming horrors will be that awful. That's their one part of their problem, brethren. They do not actually believe Jesus Christ. Then he comes and knocks on the door, you know, and he says, if anyone hears me and opens the door. So please, if any of you have this, oh, don't speak about these harsh things. Well, I have to tell you what is written in the Bible. I'm not one of those syrupy preacher of, you know, who he's going to tell you all the nice things, you know, and everything is great, and what a wonderful world in which we live. Brethren, that's not truth, brethren, that's lie. This place is a dark place. 
this is present evil world, the words of the apostle, the apostle, uh, apostle Paul. So if any of you have this feeling, oh, let's not hear these horrible, no, on the contrary, you need to hear them. We are a Philadelphia remnant. In the last century when Philadelphia era was dominant, we were hearing regularly these things. We were regularly warned about these things happening and coming. But in this Laodicean dominated age, you don't hear these churches of God, you know, preaching all kinds of things. And by the way, speaking of those churches of God registered as 501c3, I've just received a, 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 a news from Dr. Bob Thiel, and you have as well, in your emails, about the IRS. They'll be targeting those 501c3. Another reason for me, I guess, to warn all those registered on 501c3 of how compromising, what kind of compromising position they are. That's also part of their Laodicean problems, you know, brethren. And I've come to realize that I need to say, you know, to others who are registered at those 501, that they should leave those churches because those churches are lying to them. They don't speak to their members what it means to be registered as 501. C3. It means that you have speech liberty restricted. It means you cannot preach the world boldly. It means if you offend your state or the government, you may have the consequences for that. But brethren, all those main churches of God out there, except for one, except for the continuing church of God, are registered as 501c3. And we need to know that. We need to understand that. We need to understand the difference between us and other churches of God. Sometimes I wonder... Do we really get it? What is the difference between us and those other major churches of God? Well, I'll tell you two differences. Difference number one, we consider them all brethren. Regardless of their spiritual state, we consider them brethren and we act toward them as two brethren. On the contrary, they consider us as no brethren. They allow in their internal policies that you can, you know, each one of those churches respectively, that you can cooperate with any church of God out there, any, except for one. Guess which one? And that's the first difference. The second difference, we are free to preach, brethren. We are being censored. My Facebook account has been censored, by the way. I'm not able to log in. Censored because I warned the world about a German-dominated Europe which was labeled as hate speech, really. So, our legal status is different. We are not going to succumb to the governments. We are not going to compromise with the states of this world. That's what makes us, among other things, a Philadelphia remnant. Besides, we preach the truth as it is, however unpleasant it might be, and finally, we have the key of David. We have the key of David, which means we do understand the identity of modern Israel. And if there is any of you out there who do not understand, or who may not understand the identity of Israel, please pay attention to that. I'm revising right now the, uh, the draft book by Dr. Bob Thiel on the identity of Israel. Brethren, I'm very excited about that book coming out very soon. You all have to be clear about the identity of each tribe. Each tribe, brethren, there is no place for confusion. The Philadelphia remnant has no confusion whatsoever when it comes to the key of David. So please, if you do not know which tribe today is Benjamin, make sure you know it. If you do not know which tribe today is Nephtali, make sure you know it. It is crucial. It is the world history, Genesis 49. In Genesis 49, Jacob preaches, prophesied to each one of his sons what their descendants will achieve and will be doing in this age, in this last age. Which means we have to know it. That's the key of David. Verse 20. 
We acknowledge, O Lord, our wickedness and the iniquity of our fathers, for we have sinned against you. So notice, brethren, how bad it got before God punished them. Even from their fathers, they became so crooked in their nature of rebellions and outlaw and anarchy and lawlessness. That is what it end up, ends up with being the worst part. Not just missing the mark and transgressing. We all do that. We all do that, brethren, but I don't want you to be missing the mark when it comes again to the key of David. I made sure here in Serbia that even those who are prospective members not baptized, that they be clear about the identity of each tribe. I, I, I implore all of you who will be baptized soon. I implore all of you who are not baptized, bear with us. Those of you who are baptized, please make sure that you learn the identity of each tribe of Israel. That there will be no confusion whatsoever. Yes, I know that they overlap here and there. I know that we can say that in a certain nation like Denmark, for example, we may have the influence of more than one tribe. Perhaps there are Vikings, that is the Benjamites along with the Danites. That's fine, but the main, the main identity of each tribe is there. We know it. Mr. Armstrong knew it in the last century, brethren. He was the one who revived that knowledge. And the United States and Britain in prophecy was the most requested of all of our booklets, brethren. What happened to that? There was British Israelitism movement, which included Scandinavian countries and Britain and Anglo Saxon people in the nineteenth century. There was a very strong movement indeed, until the First World War. After the First World War, all of a sudden the awareness of the identity of Israel kind of dwindled. And then all of a sudden, when Hitler actually rose to power in 1933, when Mr. Armstrong began preaching so mightily, all of a sudden in that period, brethren, the truth about Israel was restored. The truth about Israel was restored. And today, a Philadelphia remnant has the key of David. Today, Philadelphia remnant needs to know the truth of Israel. I said, the United States and Prevent and Prophecy was the most requested booklet, brethren. What happened with that knowledge? Well, I'll tell you what happened with that knowledge. Many has many have given up on that knowledge. That's irrelevant to them. That's just part of this Israelitish mindset. We don't want to be God's people. We want to be pagans. We want to test and try out and do every single cult, every form of worship. We don't care about true God, but we want to be pagans, you know. A good reason, one of the reasons why God is going to punish, especially the Anglo-Saxon world, is your knowledge. The heraldry testifies who are the Anglo-Saxon people. Heraldry, if nothing else, heraldry does. How would you explain to me the North Ireland, North Ireland emblem unless you knew Bible prophecies? But regardless, people don't care. Oh, we don't want to be God's people. No, we don't want to be different from other nations. No, we want to be pagans. Is that what you want? Well, you'll then serve pagans and their gods, and then you will see how it is. Because you did not want to serve God with all joy and gladness in your heart, in all abundance, as it says in Deuteronomy 27 and 28. Brethren, once again, please make sure that you list all those tribes, you know, list the countries, and learn them. It's part of a Philadelphia remnant. Otherwise, otherwise you will not really be part of Philadelphia remnant. How can you be if you don't know those basic things? So anyway, here we have, you know, verse 20. We have sinned against you. That is better how it always starts. Just a little water overflowing the dam, you know, just missing the mark for the start. Then you get to transgressing. Then you get to trespassing. Then it becomes your very nature. Then you get rebellious until finally you're so crooked and warped up that you cannot change it. And those are all words for sin, by the way. And when we are repenting of sin and thinking of sin as leaven to put out of our homes, one of the funniest thing is that, you know, uh, is that people don't think God puts leaven, leavening out of his house. If you have been in the ministry, 
you know good and well that he does. And I've been in God's ministry now for five years. And brethren, I do know that God certainly well does. He puts leavening out of his house. And every year before the Passover, things start being stirred up and God is putting leavening out of his house. And yes, apostasy is a real thing, brethren. It happened. It happened to us a few times. Oh, this person said, oh, he is no longer interested. Or that person, that person got a different idea. This person wants to join the, this, that person got an idea that he is a prophet. This per- Brethren, God is putting leavening out of his house. If we allow spiritual leavening in our lives, he will be, will be put out of his house. Verse 21, do not abhor us for your name's sake. Do not disgrace the throne of your glory. Remember, do not break your covenant with us. Are there any among the idols of the nations that can cause rain? <laughs> well, I can ask you now this, brethren, because yesterday we got rain for the first time in a long time. I'm asking you, are there among the idols any of the nations anyone that can cause rain? And I'm living in a very idolatrous nation. Very idolatrous nation. Which keeps all kinds of customs. Yesterday they kept the... Uh, 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 how do they call it? Uh, how would I translate that one into uh, into English? Well, they, they they keep a feast, a celebration, because supposedly yesterday Christ went with his three disciples and he uh, he showed them his glory, and uh, you know, and 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 that's that they kept it yesterday as a, as a feast. Of course, that's that's supposed to be kept by by people not eating anything fat, you know, dairy products, I don't know, meat and other things. And they believe, my nation believes that uh, on that very day, on that very day, uh, heavens get, gets kind of uh, transformed and the earth gets transformed even three times, I think, or something like that. And that since heaven is open and that on that day, then uh, uh, God is there. Jesus Christ is there right there at that gate and he is here to fulfill your wish. That's how my nation views God, brethren. He's like a, he's like a Santa Claus, you know, uh, uh, Fulfilling your wishes, you see. It's just one, and it's just one aspect of, of idolatry, brethren. And you live in your nations that don't want to be God's people. No, your nations want to be pagans. Oh, we love our Christmas. Isn't it beautiful Christmas and Easter uh, customs and stuff? No, it's disgusting in God's eyes. And again, I'm asking you now. For the first time we had rain yesterday, and the whole, throughout the, the night... There was rain and, and the thunderstorms and stuff in, in, in this place. After a whole two or three months, my poor animals got kind of, kind of unsettled because there was so much lightning and so much pouring of rain. A wonderful blessing, brethren. But I'm asking, are there, are there any among the islands of the nations that can cause rain? Certainly not. No, no one of the idols of Gentiles can cause the rain. And yet the house of Israel wants all this Gentile religion and wants to practice Gentile religion and they want to be Gentiles. Or can can the heavens give showers, brethren? By the orders of the gods of these Gentiles? No, no, and no. Are you not He, O Lord our God? Therefore we will wait for you since you have made all these. How long is it going to take for the house of Israel, modern house of Israel, to understand that? Well, obviously not too long. And the great tribulation is going to sober up the remnant of Israel. But many in that great tribulation are going to die. But the remnant will be sobered up. It just behooves me, again, all the historical facts testify about American Britain and Australia and New Zealand and Norway and Sweden and Finland and Iceland and Denmark and Holland and Belgium and Luxembourg and France, northern France. All the history testifies about them being the house of Israel. And if nothing else, the heraldry Heraldry, your national emblems and symbols, you cannot 
do away with those. They are there. They testify about who those people are, and yet the house of Israel says, well, no, let's disregard. No, we don't want to be God's people. We want to be pagans. We want to have Gentile gods. We want to have Gentile forms of worship. How tragic, brethren. And I think I'm, I'm coming to realize more and more that because of that willful ignorance, because of that intentional neglectful attitude toward God, one reason why the house of Israel is going to be punished so severely is exactly because of that. Because your Israelite nations have much more, we can say, uh, uh, noble people than many Gentiles. And I mean it, brethren. I mean it because I've lived in the Gentile countries and I've lived in Israelite countries. I've seen it with my own eyes. You've got, you, you don't have so many. You have some national sins, yes, but you know, Many of your people, your Israelite nations are not kind of that crooked and that wicked and that, that, that warped up. You realize that when you allowed Romania and you made Bulgaria into the European Union. What they did, well they came to Israelite nations doing things that you could not even imagine. How crooked they are. You see, you're not, your nations are not that crooked, but there is one thing that your nations have that other nations do not have. Your nations have heraldry and history. Your nations have knowledge. Your nations know that Sabbath, especially in the Anglo-Saxon world, that the Sabbath is the true day of rest. Your nations know that Easter and, and, and Christmas are pagan to core, have nothing to do with Christ. But they ignore it. One reason why Israel is going to be punished so severely, brethren, remember, is because of knowledge. We as God's people, we as a Philadelphia remnant, we need to cherish the precious knowledge we have. And one of the most precious knowledge we do have is that we do understand the identity of modern Israel, that we do understand that there will be part of the restoring of that Israel, and that we do understand that all the nations will be grafted into Israel eventually in order to be saved. What a wonderful plan that God has given us. What a wonderful plan that Prophet Jeremiah also knew. What a wonderful plan that the prophets knew, but we are seeing the development and unraveling of those events with our own eyes, brethren, and we are going to see even more. Next time, we'll go now to the next chapter of the book of Jeremiah.